All right, well, thank you. Can everyone hear me in the back? Oh, this is good? Okay. All right, well, um, nice to see you all again. Um, I'm going to uh, talk today about, well, I want to talk about large team decision making um, in the scope of the day-to-day -day operation of the International Space Station, kind of how we operate the vehicle with hundreds of people around the world all tied in and, and working together. Um, it's really in the spirit of, of thinking about how you operate as teams and, and how you have to communicate. Um, and we'll talk at the end about decision making a little bit and, uh, uh, and how we make decisions and how we make sure that we're, we're making the right ones and how we control who's, who's making the decisions. So uh, overview wise, you saw a little bit in my talk yesterday about the International Space Station. The, and when I say ISS, I mean the spaceship, you know, as I said yesterday, not the school. Um, uh, we'll talk about mission control and how we work as a team. I kind of just said all this, so we'll keep going. Um, I talked again a little bit about this yesterday. The, the ISS was assembled um, on orbit uh, over the span of, of 13 years. Uh, it's been continuously, continuously inhabited by uh, at least uh, two crew members. Uh, started with three, then down to two, and then now up to six since uh, November of 2000. Uh, the components were built all over the world by different companies and, and in different, different countries and launched uh, over 100 launches from, from Florida in the, in the US, from Kazakhstan, uh, the, the Russian missions from Japan, and from French Guiana. Uh, the six uh, astronauts spend six months at a time on board the station, on, on, uh, kind of rotating three at a time. Uh, so there's, there's kind of some continuity as you go. And um, the Russian Soyuz spacecraft are what are used to, to do the crew rotations right now. But uh, soon we hope to see the U.S. commercial crew vehicles from SpaceX and Boeing flying to, to take crews back and forth to the station. So mission control. Um, mission control is, is basically, a, we'll, we'll talk more about functionally, but it, 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 it's a series of consoles, each one of which manages some subsystem or some function uh, on the, on either on the spacecraft or a function that's needed for the mission. That could be electrical systems, communication systems, uh, life support systems, the trajectory folks, planning, uh, mission planning and timelines and things like that. So each of the flight controllers on the team specializes in one of those areas and, uh, and they divide, divide their time between office work and console work. The office work is usually preparing for future missions, preparing for future operations, maybe new vehicles coming along, maybe doing some process, process improvements and, and trying to find better ways to do things and do things more efficiently. And then there's the console time, which is sometimes simulations running kind of uh, where we have a, a training team uh, that, that uh, devises some very nefarious scenarios for the, the flight control team to work through. Um, and then there's actually the, the mission support, of course. Each flight controller completes that training and gets certified in their position for, for mission control center operations. And, and it's mostly based on, on simulations and, and reading and things like that kind of things you'd expect from any kind of training program. So I just throw a shot of there in for me from the SpaceX-3 capture. Um, that was actually just before capture. If you look at the, I can use this fancy pointer. Um, if you look up and uh, uh, there's the crew on, in the cupola on board, uh, Rick Mastracchio and, and, uh, and uh, Koichi, uh, and, um, yeah, Koichi. Um, Wakata, uh, about to capture the, the SpaceX Dragon vehicle has maneuvered to within about 30 feet of the space station and is now sitting there, has turned off its thrusters and is, is waiting to be grappled by the Canadian robot arm and the crew here is, is getting ready to, to drive the arm in and, and effect the capture. So the, the way the, the, uh, the room is set up, the flight director is in charge of the operation. There's a CAPCOM, uh, a capsule communicator. It's a throwback to capsule days. Of course, we're going back to capsules, so it's, 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 it's uh, what's old is new again, or what's new is old again, or something. <laughs> the, the CAPCOM is usually a, an, an astronaut, um, but uh, the, over the last few years, we've transitioned to some, of, uh, some flight controllers performing roles as CAPCOMs, but they're the primary communicator with the space, with the with the crew on board the space spacecraft, um, the rest of the flight control team are the the people I mentioned who are responsible for different systems. The ADCO on the space station is responsible for for motion control, kind of pointing the vehicle. There are some big gyroscopes on board that that can be 
can, you can stabilize the vehicle, and also if you, if you torque the gyroscopes, you can actually change the attitude of the space station uh, without using any propellant, any, any fuel or, or rockets. They also have uh, connections over to the Russian segment of the space station, which does have thrusters, and the ADCO uh, has, has a uh, counterpart over in the Mission Control Center Moscow that they work with if we have to switch over to Russian thrusters that can be, that can be arranged between those, those two sets of controllers. Ethos is responsible for life support and the thermal control of the internal, the internal side of the thermal control system. Um, on board the space station, you have all these computers running and you have people and, and, and stuff you know, going on generating heat. That heat has to be rejected and you don't have um, a whole lot of places for it to go. So ba basically there are between, between fans and, and cold plates and, and basically cold water running through, through lines throughout the, the interior of the space station, that water goes to a heat exchanger that exchanges heat with an ammonia system on the external side of the space station. Now ammonia is really nasty stuff. You don't want that, um, you want, really don't want to get anywhere near that stuff. So the, the heat exchangers are, are external and, and uh, are where the, the heat gets exchanged between the internal water system and the external uh, ammonia system. The Spartan operator is responsible for the external side of the thermal control system and all the ammonia systems out on the truss elements and the big radiators that you see um, attached to the, uh, to the space station. Um, and finally, Cronus is responsible for uh, the flight computers on board and the communications uh, equipment uh, with the ground. The, those four flight controllers represent the, the core systems on board the spacecraft. And those four plus the flight director and this ground control officer the, 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 who's responsible for ground systems and facilities are the only ones who are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, round the clock, all the time. The rest of these flight controllers are there um, when they need to be, which for some of them is fairly often. For example, uh, the, the ops plan team is there most of the week except for part of the weekend. They'll, they'll have part of the weekend off. Um, the uh, EVA officer, the, they're responsible, extravehicular activity officer, they're responsible for spacewalks and spacewalk planning and all the teams that are, are, are responsible for the planning and execution of the spacewalk. They come in every day at, for, for the, the morning handover with the, the flight director and they, they do some paperwork and make sure everything is, is, is set for whatever planning is going on and then they'll go, they'll go on call. And, and so they'll, they'll leave because they're not needed there most of the time. Then when a, a, a spacewalk is actually coming up, they'll start to staff the console up and then they'll be, 20, they'll be there 24-7 through the duration of the, the actual execution and, and post-execution debriefs of the spacewalk. So that, that's true for most of all of these other flight controllers. They're there, some of them most of the time, some of them just a little bit of the time, but, uh, but they all kind of come and go. So why have a mission control? The, um, the main reason is that it frees astronauts to do the, the things that we want them to put them, put them in space for, the reason that they're there, for the exploration, the science operations, tasks that require hands and eyes on scene um, to, to um, basically the, the whole reason that we want to, want to do human space flight in the first place. The interesting thing about the International Space Station is that all of the vehicle systems, or most of the vehicle systems, are managed by mission control. The mission control team in Houston and the other teams around the world. I'll talk about those other teams here in, in just a minute. So when uh, a, a system needs to be turned on to maybe support uh, an activity coming up later in the day, that's commanded by someone on the ground. They, we, we do that from the ground. The, the crew can call down and say, hey, it's a little warm in the U.S. lab module. Can you turn it down a couple of degrees. We can do that from the ground and, and they don't have to, to go through the menus on their laptops to, 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 to make those changes. So we can, we can do almost all of the, the, uh, the control of the, the vehicle systems um, from, from the Mission Control Center. Uh, about 20,000 commands every month actually are going up to the vehicle. So it's, it's a considerable amount of, of commanding that, that happens. The other reason to have a mission control is it gives you a clear chain of command. Um, each of the flight controllers comes from their own organization with their own management. Uh, 
Um, but when they're in the, in the mission control center, they answer to the flight director, and they're responsible only to the flight director, who is the single point of, of real-time authority during the execution phase of, of the, the mission. That was a lesson learned from, uh, from John Glenn's mission, actually, that, that if you go back to in, from some of the historical uh, information, the, the Chris Kraft as the flight director had, was getting, there were a lot of arguments, they had some problems with the, the, uh, the retro rocket uh, package and whether or not the heat shield, uh, or the problem with the heat shield attachment and whether or not the heat shield was going to remain attached and there was talk about whether you keep the retro rocket pack attached or not and there were decisions made and then over, overruling decisions from management that were not on scene that were, were kind of making the call from kind of outside the room. And that caused a, 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 a lot of friction with the, uh, the flight director. And, and at that time it was established that no, the, the, the flight director is the one who's kind of in the heat of battle right there on scene and is responsible to, for making decisions. Uh, the management team can make inputs to that, but the, the ultimate authority rests with the flight director. And again, it's for real-time authority. And, and then once you complete the operation, you go back and you talk with the, the management team about how things went, and, and sometimes changes are made uh, based on that. But in, in real-time execution, you want one person to, to make the call. The priorities are always crew safety first, vehicle safety second, and then mission success. So. We'll give up the mission if it's going to cost uh, a problem, uh, maybe put the, an astronaut in danger or put the vehicle in danger. Um, you can, sometimes you, you might be wanting to complete some operation, but because of a failure, uh, you're going to lose a piece of equipment that is not something that you have a spare, spare parts for, and so you want to shut that down, and it might cost you the mission objective, but you can, you can always reschedule the mission objective and save the, save the equipment. But this philosophy built and evolved through, through all the missions I talked about yesterday, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, and the space shuttle missions. So I talked a little bit about this in, in general, but the, 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 uh, the program management is, is really the organization that, and, and there is a, a program manager who is responsible for the, the whole operation, um, and for, the whole, for the vehicle, for everything that happens on it. And the mission management team uh, and the program manager are the ones who set the overall mission objectives and, and the priorities for the mission. And then the flight control team, led by the flight director, is responsible for executing the mission. That's where that real-time mission authority comes in, the real-time decision-making and, and risk management. Um, and then there's, there's a lot of, of office support and, and non-real-time analysis that goes on. If something has to be looked at, that can be, can be looked at off, off in the... In the kind of outside of the mission control center um, as necessary. And then obviously the astronauts are, are on board the, the vehicle and, and working with the flight control team. This is a greatly simplified um, diagram of, of how the whole uh, uh, thing is set up. Mission Control Center Houston is kind of the, the, the focal point for the ground operations. There are, are links through tracking and data relay satellites and other assets uh, through a network um, of really this is vastly oversimplified there's a huge amount of network elements that connect the mission control center to the vehicle but but it's basically um, basically goes through through satellite relays and then those commands and telemetry and voice links get transmitted from the mission control center in Houston to these partner control centers in uh, Japan, Germany, Russia, Canada, and uh, in uh, a payload control center in Huntsville, Alabama. There's also commercial partners involved, SpaceX and Northrop Grumman fly uh, uh, uncrewed um, uh, cargo vehicles. Sierra Nevada is working on an uncrewed cargo vehicle, and both SpaceX and Boeing are working on crew versions of, of uh, vehicles that will be flying uh, soon. So the, the partner control centers are responsible for the operations within their portion of the ISS. The, the control center in Moscow is responsible for the Russian segment, which is a fairly, fairly large part of the International Space Station. Um, kind of the, the uh, if you're looking at it from front to back, it's kind of the, the back half. There's a connection in, in, the, in the middle. The first two elements that were launched were a Russian element and then a, a, a United States uh, node, and kind of it built in both directions from, from there. Uh, 
The, uh, the Moscow team manages the Russian segment. There's a team in Munich that, uh, that manages the uh, European segment, which is primarily the Columbus module, which is off to the starboard side at the front of the vehicle, off to the starboard side of node two. Um, and uh, it, the SCUBA, uh, Japan Control Center, manages the Japanese segment, which is their Kibo uh, uh, Japanese experiment module and, and the, the equipment that exists in it. So that's off on the port side at the front of the vehicle. And then up in Montreal is, is uh, a robotics um, back room type uh, setup that can interface with the Mission Control Center. It's almost like an extension of the Mission Control Center in Houston is the way we set it up back a few years, uh, many years ago now. But um, we actually have done motion operations with the arm that's commanded by a robotics officer in Canada with no robotics support in the Mission Control Center in Houston. That was really just actually just done for the first time not too long ago, um, which, is, which is really cool. Um, it's really great to have them able to, to manage that and have their robotics operators up there in, in Montreal at their headquarters. So Moscow, Munich, and Scuba all have their own 24-7 support. It's round the clock all the time. Um, the Payload Operations Control Center in Huntsville is also a 24-7 operation, and that's where they do the integrated uh, science operations. So all the payloads, or most of the payloads that are, are managed on the U.S. segment and the, the, the kind of the non-Russian, I, I say the U.S. segment, when I, when I say that I mean the U.S., the European Space Agency and uh, the JAXA and uh, CSA are all part of the, the U.S. on-orbit segment. The Russian segment is, is largely managed um, on its own by the, the team in Moscow. But the Payload Ops Control Center has a Payload Ops Director, and they reach out not only to, to I experts in the different payloads, but they actually have, have connections out to payload um, developers and principal investigators all over the world that, that kind of... Uh, all are integrated through that, that control center there in Huntsville. So the partner flight directors and the pod, the payload ops director, all report to the Houston flight director, and the Houston flight director is responsible for the overall integrated vehicle. There are times when the, the Houston flight director will kind of hand over to the Russian flight director, for example, when a Soyuz is docking to the Russian segment. The primary control is handed over to the Russian side, and, and, and the, the Russian flight director is, is really in charge of, of the overall operation, um, then hand, handed back after the docking is complete. Speaking of visiting vehicles, um, there are control centers for, for those as well. They're responsible for operations and control of the vehicles that are coming to and, and departing from the, the International Space Station. The uh, H-2 transfer vehicle, uh, which is a Japanese uh, uh, a vehicle, uh, independently launched and, and that flies up to, to get grabbed by the, the robot arm. They're, that's managed out of SCUBA. Um, Hawthorne, California, their SpaceX uh, Dragon uh, spacecraft, which is now two spacecraft. They have their, their uncrewed version, and now the crewed version is, is getting, getting ready to fly its second mission. Uh, Northrop Grumman has a control center in Dulles, uh, Virginia, uh, where they control their Cygnus spacecraft, which is an uncrewed um, vehicle that's, that's captured by the robot arm. And then in Moscow, as I mentioned, the, the Soyuz for crew missions and progress, which is their cargo vehicle um, operations are controlled out of Moscow. Um, for visiting vehicle missions, those are, are mostly staffed 24-7 for the duration of their missions, but sometimes when a, a mission is going on for a month, you, you fly this cargo vehicle up and you hook it up to the side of the space station, you open the hatch, and, and now there's, there's a month worth of work to get everything out of it, put it away, and put a bunch of you know, trash or return hardware into it. Um, so sometimes they will go into a kind of a quiescent phase where the, the vehicle is, is not really powered or active, and, and they'll take the, their teams on call to where only if a problem happens, they'll, they'll come back into to the console. But for the most part, they're, they're staffed um, during their missions, uh, uh, at least during critical times. The visiting vehicle flight directors are responsible for their vehicle all the way up until they get to within a couple hundred meters of the, the space station. And then they get into, they're approaching what we call integrated operations when you're the visiting vehicle is kind of within the sphere of influence of the International Space Station. And at that point, 
the Houston flight director becomes the, the lead uh, for, for decision making. And if a decision is, needs to be made to, to tell a, a vehicle to abort, that, that, can, that decision then, decision making authority uh, transitions over to Houston uh, during those integrated operations, and which, which just makes sense. You have to have, again, the important thing is you need to have one single point of authority um, at all times for the vehicle. And when a, a visiting vehicle is flying on its own well away from the space station, any problems with that vehicle, they may affect its ability to get to the space station or, or not, but um, that can be managed by that, that team and that agency or that company on their own. It's when they get close to the space station that you have to, have, you have to decide who's going to be in charge. Okay, so a little bit about team coordination and how we work together. Kind of three aspects of that um, that we'll talk about, but the emphasis is really on making sure that everyone's working to the same game plan. Objectives are coordinated, documentation is all written down and understood and, and agreed to by everybody, a common timeline um, uh, and, and effective communications, and, and it's, it's all about the teamwork. I'm going to talk about each one of these elements as we go starting with procedures and, and flight rules, kind of our written documentation. Procedures are how you, how you operate the vehicles. Um, you have specific instructions to perform a task. It could be a task that the astronauts are doing on board, or it could be a task that mission control is doing. For example, um, if, if an, a vehicle is approaching and there's a problem and I need to tell it to abort and I need, it's a robotic vehicle, I need to have some sequence of instructions and some sequence of commands and, and tasks that have to be done in the right order to tell it to go away. And uh, that would be an example of a, of a procedure. Now, flight rules are a little bit different. They're decision-making tools. They're, at their core, they're pre-planned decisions designed to avoid the need for detailed discussions when you really don't have time to have a detailed discussion. Um, they're particularly important during time-critical operations, um, obviously. Um, and you, you don't have, I mean, the example there is, is one of define what's the minimum pressure allowed. If you're dealing with a cabin leak, the first thing you want to do is figure out how much time do you have. And there's tools and procedures, actually, that the, the crew on board the spacecraft and the ground team can use to figure out how much time they have. And, and before the, basically all the air leaks out of the vehicle. And, and if you don't have a whole lot of time, you've got to send the crew to their, to their rescue vehicles, basically their Soyuz vehicles, and get the hatch closed so they're safe and, and you just let the rest of the vehicle go to vacuum because you, you, you don't have time to deal with it. So defining what that minimum pressure is that says we got to go right now it is really important to not be arguing about while the air is leaking out of the spacecraft. You want to have that already decided that at this point we're, we need a rate of uh, a manageable rate and then we can go around and look and close hatches and see if we can figure out where the leak is and if we can get it isolated to a particular module then that's great. We can isolate that module and the rest of the space station is, is, is safe and the, the crew is safe in it. Um, but if we can't find the leak or if the leak is too fast you've got to make the decision to basically get out and, and get to a, a, a safe place, which is the rescue vehicle. So that's an, kind of an extreme example, but, but flight rules are really the core of the decision making in, in the Mission Control Center. We've got hundreds and hundreds, actually thousands of them, I think. It's, it's two binders about two and a half inches thick if you print them all out. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting process to try to, to define things because everyone, there's a lot of people involved and a lot of different ideas about how you can manage certain failures. And so you, you have these arguments and you can argue about things for months or even years sometimes to decide what you're going to do in a particular scenario. But once you write it down and all agree that this is how we're going to manage things for now, at least until we change it again, but this is how we're going to manage things if something happens in real time, that's really important because you want to have that kind of focus in, in real time. Um, you don't have time to be kind of going off the rails and, and kind of figuring, trying to guessing at what you're going to do. The other thing about flight rules, um, well, both, both procedures and flight rules are carefully controlled and maintained electronically on board and in the control center. And this is really important too. 
Flight rules have to be program approved before, we're, before they're used. And what I mean by that is, remember if that, that pyramid I showed, the program is really responsible for all of it. They're responsible for the hardware, for the software, for everything that's going on. And the operations team is responsible for executing the mission that the program asked the team to execute. And, um, and so flight rules have that, that effect of potentially changing what's going to happen in the mission or what's going to get accomplished. And so it's really important that the, the flight rules are written and, and then basically approved by the program. That's why we call it this kind of handshake with the program that says, yes, we understand how you're going to operate our vehicle and, and everyone's in agreement. Very important um, to have the, that coordinated um, agreement on that. So verbal communications. Um, all the flight controllers at all the different control centers have, have comm panels that have dozens and dozens and dozens of, of what we call voice loops on them. They're basically communications circuits, kind of different lines to different flight controllers. Each flight controller will have a loop that is kind of dedicated to them or a, maybe a series of loops that is dedicated to them. Um, there's one particular loop called the flight director loop, which is, which is obviously the flight director's loop, and, and that's where overall coordination is done um, and, and is, is really the, the nexus for, for where the, the, uh, the mission authority lies. Um, every shift, uh, there's, the shifts are nine hours, so every nine hours a new team comes in. They take an hour to, to get a handover from the team that's off going, and the oncoming flight director will then go onto a separate loop, kind of a, a, a debrief loop, and, and go around and talk to each one of the controllers and each one of the partner control centers and say, to talk about what's going on, maybe some failures that have happened, maybe some things that have been resolved, maybe, excuse me, maybe some major activity that's coming up and some coordination that's going to be required during the next shift. But you, you kind of, it's kind of huddle up and, and, and uh, talk about what's going to happen over the next eight hours. And once that flight director and team is, are happy, they let the other team go. They, can, they go home and, and uh, the, the oncoming team takes over. So that happens every nine hours, uh, basically around the clock, around the year. The flight loop is really central, to, as I said, to keeping the team in sync. Um, that's where big picture activities, uh, big picture statuses are made and, uh, and any formal decisions, go, no, go calls when you hear some of the, the old tapes of Gene Kranz going around, going to go for, for, a, you know, for a, um, a power descent or something like that during Apollo 11. Those are on the flight loop where he's polling all the flight, flight controllers. And there are periods of time in the timeline that are called out that says, here's where we're going to do that go, no, go poll. And so the, the whole team needs to be ready to, to answer and, and crisply go through to make sure that everything is, is right to be able to proceed with, with that, that portion of the mission. And then, as I mentioned, I think before, the discussions with the crew all occur through the CAPCOM primarily. We make a few exceptions there. And those go through what we call space-to-ground loops, which are the are specific loops that are, are talking to the vehicle. So this is kind of, kind of a picture on the ground of, of how this all goes. But it, really, from a flight control team perspective, there's a flight director here in Houston, one in Moscow, one in Scuba, one in Munich, a payload ops director. They're all talking to each other mostly on the flight loop. I say that with a little asterisk here because the Houston-Moscow discussions happen on a separate loop that has a translator uh, going on. And, it, and, and official decisions between the Houston and Moscow flight director or the ESA and Moscow flight director um, or the JAXA and Moscow flight director sometimes will happen on that, on that uh, separate loop. Um, and that's because we have interpreters to, to work the Russian to, US, uh, Russian to English interpret, uh, interpretation. And then the flight control teams support each of the flight directors in their, in their own organizations. Um, decisions made on the flight loop, well, we're going to talk a minute about written communication, the written um, stuff, which is, is really important. But it's also important to note that decisions that are made on the flight loop are considered official decisions and are considered to be documented. It's, it's recorded, and, and that's one way to, that's one exception to the make sure it's written down rule. So written communications. We use electronic tools um, uh, to, to, to document and transmit information to each other. Um, 
it's, it's well controlled, it's traceable. Um, the, the names aren't so important to, to, to you, but what we call them, we call flight notes, which are, are kind of short-term actions or status information, or maybe something's, maybe something's not behaving with a certain system, and we're going to need the, the astronauts to take a few steps to put it in a good configuration. And if it's not just turn it off, you know, which you don't need to write that down. You can call up and you can say, turn that thing off. If it's going to take three or four or five or six steps to, to do that, we might have the flight controller write down what those steps are. They'll put it in a flight note so that we can look at it and say, yeah, that looks good to us. And then sometimes if we have to, we can turn it into a message that gets sent up to the crew and they can have it on their laptop and they can follow it, basically the, the written communication uh, there um, on board. We have things called chits, which are our requests for data or analysis that goes outside of the control center to the engineering team or sometimes to the program team. So, um, for example, a uh, piece of equipment that's not behaving properly and maybe it's, it's running warmer than it should, it's supposed to. And there's some concern about whether or not it's, it's, it's about to, to break a flight rule limit that says don't operate it above this temperature. But we have reason to believe that it, it's going to just go a little bit above that and then it's going to be okay. We might write a chit to the engineering community that says, hey, what do you think about operating this a little bit warmer and, and deviating from that flight rule and, and operating a little bit differently than what we had written down? Again, the most important thing is we're writing these things down and keeping track of, of what we're doing so that everyone is, is on the same page. And then anomaly reports are, are really how we capture the unexpected. If, if something, un, uh, something happens that we, we didn't expect, that we can't explain, we want to be able to squawk that. We want to write it down. Here's what happened. Here's when it happened. Here's what we saw. And it may or may not be a big impact to the mission, um, but it, it may be something, it's definitely something that we want to understand because if, it's, if it turns out that some piece of equipment is failing, we want to know you know, that, that maybe we're going to have to replace it in, in a couple of weeks. Um, if, it could be that it's just working in a way that has been seen before and it's not anything to worry about, and that maybe should go into the procedures for how to operate that piece of equipment now so you can not have to worry about it. It's not considered an anomaly anymore. But if, if, if it's not explained, it gets written down, and then it gets sent off to the engineering community to look at so they can just determine whether or not it's really um, something that needs to be dug into a little bit more. Really important, what we don't use, um, transient communication techniques. Sending an email, uh, even though email is traceable and all that stuff, it, it's, it's outside of the control of the documentation we have in the control center. So email, text messaging, telephone calls, over the air conversations with, uh, between people, someone standing up, a flight controller standing up and turn, turning around and saying over the air, not through the loop, can, and this has happened actually, Michelle's smiling because um, she's seen it. Um, but I, sometimes flight controllers are very close to the flight director in proximity. And they'll stand up and they'll turn around and they'll lean on the console and they'll tell this big, long, beautiful explanation about why they have to take some action, why some action needs to be taken. And, you know, you'll sit there looking at them, uh-huh. You know, and then they'll say, here's, so we want to do this. And, and I'll, I've, I've looked at them and I said, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful explanation. Now, why don't you tell me on the loop? In other words, call me on the flight director loop and tell me so that everyone else who's part of this operation can hear what's going on with your system and what you need to do with it so that they can hear, hear what's happening and, and understand where we're going. And sometimes someone else might have some issue with that or they may have a question about it. Maybe what we're about to do is going to impact a payload operation that we hadn't thought about. The payload operations director can say, hey, wait a minute, before you do that, let us turn off this payload or let, let me put this payload in a safe state so we don't lose science while you take the action on your system. So again, really important that those things happen. The over the air conversations are fine to, to have someone come up and say, hey, you know, I got a little something working that I'm going to have to talk to you about in about 10 minutes. So just so you know, uh, that's, that's fine. That's, that's just pre-coordination. But when it, when it comes down to... to those informal conversations really need to be summarized formally. Okay, the timeline. The whole crew and all the ground teams operate from a common timeline. Um, 
Any changes to that timeline get reported on the flight loop, and so everyone hears it. They can work their recovery plans. If, if uh, let's say you're going to uh, deploy a, uh, um, a, a CubeSat from, from a, or you're going you're to put a CubeSat into the, the JAXA, the GEM airlock, and put it on the slide table so that it can be put out and the robotic arm outside can take it and fire the CubeSats off the next day. Um, something might happen to where the, the, the CubeSat isn't ready or something happens and maybe a, a power failure that causes the, the airlock to not be in, a, in its normal operating state. And that can change the whole timeline and ripple through the whole timeline from there. So working that in the flight loop, this is what happened and here's what's happening to the timeline can help the whole team then now figure out what to do with their activities later, but also sometimes you have to backfill activities and find things for the, the astronauts to do now. Sometimes they can get some get ahead on some stuff for later in the day, something like that. So the changes to the timeline are, are approved only by the flight director, and again, that's all about keeping everyone uh, together on the same, same page. Now Michelle's going to look at this and say, that's not what it looks like now anymore. Um, this is actually an old version of the, the timeline tool. I, I, I realized that and I didn't have, have time to put that. But it basically looks the same as now. It's just the name has changed. <laughs> but here you see, uh, uh, here's time in GMT, Greenwich Mean Time here. Here's bands that show the, the communication coverage with the satellites, with the, the tracking and data relay satellites. Here's some ground station coverage for the, the, the Russian ground sites, of, of which there are several. And then here's crew members, the six crew members and their activities. The ones that are grayed out have been completed already. Uh, the ones that have common colors are sequenced, meaning you've got to do things in a certain order or they're, they're connected together and they're, um, they, they're, they're related to each other. Things with a blue box around them happen at that time no matter what, so they're marked time critical. That's what the blue box means. And then down here are crew constraints. These are things that the, the astronauts need to know, like here. It says hands off what is it? R2SSC. R2 SSC. So, so that means hands off that particular computer for the, this period of time because of some activity that's going on, probably from the ground. Um, and then here's some, an MCC coordination band that it helps, helps the different control centers uh, 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 manage their time together. And then down below here, it, it, there's a, actually there's a scroll bar. It goes way down. There's all sorts of stuff. We go through the floor. Um, shows all the commanding and what commands are going to be sent by what systems and things like that. So it's the very detailed timeline, and it's, it, it's put together very deliberately and in, in a very controlled way so that everyone is, is working from the same sheet of music. Okay. Wow, this is going longer than I thought. <laughs> Execution phase is how we get ready for a major operation. There's really three parts to this. Um, there's the pre-flight part, real time, and, and post-flight. We're going to talk about each one of these, so I'll keep going here. As I mentioned before, the mission objectives are set by the, the program, and then it's up to the operations team to figure out the best way to accomplish those objectives within the constraints that we've laid out and said, here's how we're going to operate the vehicle, that we've agreed with the program about how we're going to do that. So there's high-level timelines developed and then low-level timelines and very detailed ones. And sometimes you can recommend changes back to the program. You can say, hey, you know what? If, if we can do this a different way, we can get some other objectives you know, that we weren't expecting to, to get, and maybe we should put those into the plan too. Or maybe everything isn't going to fit, and that was a, that's a very common thing. You, the program says, do all this stuff, and you say, well, we can, we can do everything down to about here, and everything below that has got to go. There's just not time to do it. Well, then you might have to do some rearranging of priorities to say, well, we really want to move these up and we'll move these down and we'll, we'll take care of those later. So it's an iterative process. It starts about a year before the mission. It's, when you think about it, you're building a, basically a six-month timeline or you know, months at a time type of timeline. And then we conduct simulations, which are kind of stress tests of, of the whole system. They stress test procedures, flight rules, timelines. They're looking for weak points. And, and help prepare the operations teams for the, the real-time pace. Um, and they're really important for critical operations where you have to make these decisions on a, on, in, in seconds or minutes and, uh, and be able to make them in a timely manner or you're gonna, gonna have a problem. So the typical weak points uncovered during preparation and especially in sims are things like 
things that we didn't think of. Maybe a failure scenario that doesn't have a properly documented flight rule or procedure for it. Um, the training team is really good at finding little things that will drive the flight control team crazy and maybe they find a hole in the procedure or a flight rule and they drive the failure right in that direction to kind of call attention to it. Um, the, there's the, we didn't mean to do that or conflicting requirements. You could have a case where you have a failure in an electrical system and a failure in a, uh, another, uh, uh, maybe the life support systems. And the way that the, the flight rules say, with this electrical system failure, we've got to turn this stuff off. But your life support system may be depending on the stuff you're about to turn off. And so you've got, a, you've got these conflicting rules that says, this says don't turn it off, and this says turn it off. And we've got to figure, you've got to kind of break the tie and figure out how you're going to manage the, the conflict. Uh, we're not giving ourselves enough time. Maybe there's not enough time reserved to do something critical. That's a, a common one. Um, we find that out actually quite often in real time when the crew is doing something, especially it might be a new crew member who hasn't been on board for very long. And we try to account for first time through a procedure, um, trying, doing it for real. They've done it in training, but now they're doing it in space for real. And it might take them a little bit longer than expected. And, and that can have an impact on the timeline, and so you want to try to find those things ahead of time. And then communications uh, issues about sync points that are not in, in the right spot or, or um, just, just areas of the timeline where that, are, that can expose some miscommunication. In real time, the, the, the job is to execute the mission, and that's the, the uh, running the procedures and, and running things per the flight rules and per the timeline, respond to anomalies based on the flight rules. The only deviations you make from procedures or flight rules are, are after su a sufficient discussion of the, the rationale or why you're going to deviate, the analysis of the risk, at least in real time, and only with the approval of the flight director. Otherwise, you've got to basically stand down and, and, and uh, and talk about it kind of outside of the, the control center if you can. And again, that's where that single point of authority comes in. The, the flight director can decide, okay, we're just gonna stop what we're doing here, and we're gonna, it's gonna push this whole operation off today, and it means that tomorrow's spacewalk might not be able to be done because of what we're not going to do today. We're gonna, it, it's gonna completely change the timeline for the next week. But that's a decision that has to be made in real time and it, it, you don't have time to, to, to have a, a big discussion with program management uh, about that. Other things, you could have a failure of a particular piece of equipment or a payload or a, an experiment that is not behaving the way it should, and it's a standalone experiment, and it, it's, if you turn it off, the only thing you're going to have to do is figure out where you're going to put it again on the timeline some other day or some other week. And that's a case where it's, you say, okay, we're, we're not going to troubleshoot this anymore because I don't want to ruin the rest of the day, the rest of the timeline. We're going to maybe troubleshoot 10 more minutes, and if, you don't, if you're not successful, then we're going to stop on this and we're going to move on with our day. And then the other thing in, in real time is to document uh, things after the, the mission, what went right, what didn't go, didn't go so well, um, why we made deviations from, from procedures or rules. And then post-flight, there's formal reviews that are gone through to, to investigate what was done and, and how it went. Um, I mentioned earlier about anomaly investigation and having the engineering teams go into detail about, about what was going on and how does that fold back into our documentation and how we're going to timeline and, and work that in the future. And then the debriefs are, are done with the astronauts and with the flight control teams. The, we've gone more and more lately to to on-orbit debriefs. So there, if there's a major activity like a spacewalk uh, or a robotic operation where the, the crew captures a visiting vehicle and then installs it um, at, onto the, to one of the, the uh, docking ports or the berthing ports, the, um, we'll schedule a debrief while they're still up there, just shortly after the, the, uh, uh, the operation, while it's still fresh in their mind. You want to capture that well, you know, the, you, you don't want to ask them six months later, so what did you think about what happened when you when, when you did this, and they're like, well, it kind of went okay. I don't really remember, but if you catch it you know, within a couple days, it's, you get a lot better information. And then, uh, again, document what, what, went, what went well, what didn't, and, and how, how do you fold in folding it back into, 
how you're going to do things next time. Okay, I'm just about wrapped up here. Um, keys for critical decision making. It's all about preparation. It's kind of like that whole real estate joke. You know, what's the keys to real estate? Location, location, location. It's all preparation, preparation, preparation. Um, you want um, pre-coordinated and agreed upon written guidance for decisions that are followed to the letter, even if you don't agree with them. If, if there's a, a disagreement with a flight rule that really has a safety impact, that is really going to cause harm to people or the vehicle, you've got to bring that up before the mission. You've got to, if you see that coming, you've got to bring that up. And, and in real time, too, you can, you, it can be brought up, but, but it has to be you know, a good reason and it has to be a safety-related reason because otherwise, you know, how many times do you get hundreds of people together and have everyone agree on everything that you're going to do? Not very often. So that's why it's important to once you establish what you're going to do, you have to follow it to the letter, even if it, you were kind of on the side that said, I really think we should do it this way, but I understand and that's the way we're going to operate. So it has to be followed that way. The preparation and simulations are all about making it part of your kind of muscle memory and, and your, your kind of the way your, way your brain is, is wired for, for the operation. And then executing that common procedure, common timeline as a, as a group with open and traceable communications, a clear chain of command, and then talking about it afterwards about what, how, how things went. Okay, I want to talk just for a minute here about the foundations of flight operations. These are things that have built up qualities that we expect of our flight control teams, our flight control team members that have built up over time. There used to be four of them that kind of morphed into six, um, and then a seventh one was added after the Columbia accident. But the first four were back from the Apollo days, and they used to be, used to be, um, um, Gene Kranz would give a talk about discipline, morale, toughness, and competence. Those were the four. Now the discipline and morale were kind of, they, they kind of got split out into, into uh, a couple more, so that it really turned into a core of six. But the first one being, uh, well, to instill within ourselves these qualities essential to professional excellence, the first one being discipline, which is about being able to follow as well as to lead and knowing that we have to master ourselves before we can master our task. So it's, this is about being disciplined enough to know that it's not my call right now and I'm going to be the follower, but sometimes I need to step up and take charge and be the leader. And so that's, that's really where, where that comes in. The next one is competence, that there's no substitute for total preparation and complete dedication because space will not tolerate being careless or indifferent. There's too many risks. Um, so that competence is really important, that total preparation. Confidence is about believing in ourselves and believing in others. And, and that's the tricky part. You've got to know how and when to be able to trust your teammates, knowing that you have to master fear and hesitation before you can succeed. So you can't be afraid to say, hey, wait a minute, we've got to stop doing this right now. You need to step up and, and, and have the confidence in yourself that you understand and you've, you've prepared and, and, and understand what you need to do. Responsibility, realizing that it can't be shifted to others. It belongs to each of us. And we all have to answer to, for what we do or what we don't all the time. And then tough and competent came up after the Apollo 1 fire that I talked about yesterday. Toughness is about, is about taking a stand when we must to try again and again, even if it means uh, following a more difficult path. And then, uh, I'm sorry, we already covered competence. And then teamwork is respecting and utilizing the abilities of others, realizing that we all work towards a common goal. We're all in this together and, and we're, we're pulling in the same direction and we, we need everyone to be, to be part of that team. And then the one that was added after the Columbia accident in 2003 was vigilance. And that was about always being attentive to the dangers of space flight Never accepting success as a substitute for rigor in everything we do. Those are the, 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 the core of the foundations. Um, the, the next one is the one that there, there's, a, there's some plaques in the wall. When you walk from, from um, there's two flight ops buildings, or, or, or the main flight ops building, and you walk in from the, the one building, this is right there in front of you, and it always kind of kind of makes me hesitate, you know, stops me in my tracks when I see it, and that's the one that says, to always, always be aware that suddenly and unexpectedly we may find ourselves in a role where our performance has ultimate consequences. So 
you never know when it's going to happen, but something might happen that says, I've got to do something right now, and if I don't, it's going to hurt somebody, or it's going to hurt the vehicle, or it's, you know, something, something really bad is going to happen. And that's, that's really a, a biggie. And then the last one is to recognize that the greatest error is not to have tried and failed, but to, to know that in trying, we didn't give it our best effort. And the last slide here is, um, is basically something that Gene Cran said to his team uh, on the Monday morning following the Apollo 1 fire um, about mission control. And uh, this is where he, well, you can read it, but he said, when you leave this meeting today, you will go to your office, and the first thing you will do is write tough and competent on your blackboards, and it will never be erased. Um, each day when you enter the room, the Mission Control Center, these words will remind you of the price paid by Grissom, White, and Chaffee. And these words are the price of admission to the ranks of mission control. So, that, I mean, that's really powerful, but that's really what it's about, is, is the, the failures that have cost people their lives are taken very seriously and very personally by the people that are responsible and are in the trenches in mission control all the time. Um, and I'll, I'll also point out this uh, emblem here was created by one of our ground controllers with help from uh, Mike Okuda, who was a, a designer for the Star Trek, um, uh, some of the Star Trek series. Uh, but it's a, basically a spaceflight memorial emblem that mem memorializes the Apollo 1 crew, the Challenger crew, the, uh, the Columbia crew. And it uh, basically says, uh, is, uh, basically it's about always exploring uh, 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 to the stars through it with to the stars through adversity, and uh, the three of the three missions. So, anyway, that's all I have for today. And if we have time for questions, we certainly do. Please, before questions. Oh, well.